October 20, 1977. Leonard Skinner's plane crash. 580 miles out of Greenville, South Carolina, bound for Baton Rouge. 24 passengers aboard are heading for a concert date Friday night. They're relaxing. Some are playing poker. Most musicians at a certain point will sit down and they'll say, you know, is our time coming? I mean, when you fly two and three hundred airplanes a year, you always feel that there's a point when it may catch up with you. It is shortly before six o'clock Central Daylight Time. The pilot, Walter McCreary of Dallas, Texas, radios Houston Air Traffic Control. He's low on fuel and can't make Baton Rouge 80 miles away. Instead, he'll try for a small airport at nearby Macomb, Mississippi. When we found out 10 minutes from the Baton Rouge airport that we ran out of gas, and uh, I just heard the pilot go, oh my God. Pilot McCreary turns his plane to the left and starts back toward Macomb. His altimeter reads 2,000 feet. The time is just past 6 o'clock. One of the engines on the conveyor quits, probably starved for fuel. My wife and I were out sitting in our backyard, and we heard this plane come over. With, it sounded like it run on one engine. And uh, then all of a sudden, I heard that engine go out. By now, Pilot McCreary is desperately looking for a spot for an emergency landing. He follows a pipeline route. For reasons unknown, McCreary changes his mind and heads for a better spot, a pasture off to his left. The Convair 240 is in a glide, 100 yards short of the pasture. The wings are clipping treetops. The plane stalls and goes down. The Leonard Skinner band was riding high. They had just released a new album, Street Survivors, and set out on a five-month cross-country tour to promote it. They were on their way to a concert at Louisiana State University when disaster happened. We got to spiral down, trying to lose altitude, find a place to land. And I thought he was going to make this field, and at the last minute I saw that it wasn't. I started clipping pine trees. And at that point I grabbed a blanket and bridged myself and put the blanket over my face. All I saw was treetops. I looked out my window, I was in the middle of the airplane on the right wing. I tried to get close to the back of the airplane as possible. But I got in the middle of the airplane on the right wing, and um, all I saw was treetops. And at, at first it wasn't so bad, but then when it hit the, you know, the middle of the trees, it was horrible. You know, it, was, it was an experience nobody wants to ever experience. Never. He and his Billy Powell, drummer Artemis Pyle, and another passenger managed to climb through a window and go for help. Neighbors who'd heard the crash were among the first rescue workers to arrive. We walked through the woods to the site, and at that time there was nobody on the site. Well, we started getting them out then, getting the ones that were hurt out, and everybody's out too. Under the glare of helicopter floodlights, the 23 victims were pulled one by one from the wreckage, placed on stretchers, and carried 100 yards through dense woods and across a creek to waiting ambulances. They were rushed to Southwest Mississippi Medical Center in Macomb. It took more than an hour to get all the victims to the hospital. Six are dead. Eleven are admitted for treatment after receiving emergency care. Eight are flown to two other hospitals in Jackson, Mississippi. One, Drummer Pyle, was treated and released. By all accounts, the hospital staff handled the disaster well. The head doctor credited countless rehearsals, which he said prepared his people for the real thing. Before dawn the next morning, the hospital had compiled a list of 26 names and notified next of kin. The dead, the pilot and co-pilot. Band leader Ronnie Van Zant. Guitarist Steve Gaines. His sister, singer Cassie Gaines, and assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick of Jacksonville. The 20 survivors included singer Leslie Hawkins, bass guitarist Leon Wilkerson, guitarist Alan Collins, and guitarist Gary Rossington. Wilkerson and Rossington suffered the most severe injuries. He has two broken arms, a broken leg, a broken pelvis, a punctured stomach, and a punctured liver. And he's going to be in the hospital in Jackson, Mississippi for about another month. But uh, Leon, Leon's got tremendous amounts of internal injuries, and Alan's got a, a broken, not a broken neck, but a cracked neck. Every airplane crash is methodically investigated by specialists from the National Transportation Safety Board. They look at wreckage as pieces of a puzzle, which when put together will tell them why a plane crashed. The search at the scene even extends to the passenger's luggage. The board looks into about 4,500 mishaps a year. Realize, seeing one of these things on television, exactly what a crash of this magnitude looks like. Up there, sitting against the tree, is a piece of an airplane wing, torn away from the rest of the airplane. Lying down there, at the base of the tree, is the engine. And that back there, that twisted metal back there, is the fuselage of the plane, which sort of was turned around a corner. It was just terrible. People are hollering, screaming, and I've never witnessed anything before in my lifetime. It was just a disaster to me. I've never seen anything like it. That same Convair and, uh, 240 plane hard. was checked by the band Aerosmith's crew the for possible tour use. 
but the plane and crew were deemed unsafe, so they chose another. The cause of the crash was it ran out of fuel. Band members Ronnie Van Zant, Steve Gaines, Cassie Gaines, the assistant manager, and both pilots died. Twenty would survive. It is one of music's greatest tragedies. The surviving band members would go on a 10-year anniversary tour in 1987. To this day, the band still records and tours all over the country.